Selection 4. The Creature Finds Paradise Lost. He enters the cottage to speak with De Lacey. One night, during my accustomed visit to the neighboring wood, where I collected my own food, I found on the ground a leather portmanteau containing several articles of dress and some books. I eagerly seized the prize and returned with it to my hovel. Fortunately, the books were written in the language the elements of which I had acquired at the cottage. They consisted of Paradise Lost, a volume of Plutarch's Lives, and The Sorrows of Werther. The possession of these treasures gave me extreme delight. I now continually studied and exercised my mind upon these histories, whilst my friends were employed in their ordinary occupations. I can hardly describe to you the effect of these books. They produced in me an infinity of new images and feelings that sometimes raised me to ecstasy, but more frequently sunk me into the lowest dejection. The volume of Plutarch's Lives which I possessed contained the histories of the first founders of the ancient republics. This book had a far different effect upon me from the sorrows of Werther. I learned from Werther's imaginations despondency and gloom, and Plutarch taught me high thoughts. He elevated me above the wretched sphere of my own reflections to admire and love the heroes of past ages. But Paradise Lost excited different and far deeper emotions. I read it as I had read the other volumes which had fallen into my hands as a true history. It moved every feeling of wonder and awe that the picture of an omnipotent God warring with his creatures was capable of exciting. Like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence. But his state was far different from mine in every other respect. He had come forth from the hands of God, a perfect creature, happy and prosperous, guarded by the especial care of his Creator. He was allowed to converse with and acquire knowledge from beings of a superior nature. But I was wretched, helpless, and alone. Many times I considered Satan as the fitter emblem of my condition, for often, like him, when I viewed the bliss of my protectors, the bitter gall of envy rose within me. These were the reflections of my hours of despondency and solitude. But when I contemplated the virtues of the cottagers, their amiable and benevolent dispositions, I persuaded myself that when they should become acquainted with my admiration of their virtues, they would compassionate me and overlook my personal deformity. Could they turn from their door one, however monstrous, who solicited their compassion and friendship? The winter advanced, and an entire revolution of the seasons had taken place since I awoke into life. My attention at this time was solely directed towards my plan of introducing myself into the cottage of my protectors. I revolved many projects, but that on which I finally fixed was to enter the dwelling when the blind old man should be alone. I had sagacity enough to discover that the unnatural hideousness of my person was the chief object of horror with those who had formerly beheld me. My voice, although harsh, had nothing terrible in it. I thought, therefore, that if, in the absence of his children, I could gain the goodwill and mediation of the old de Lacey, I might, by his means, be tolerated by my younger protectors. One day, when the sun shone on the red leaves that strewed the ground, the old man, at his own desire, was left alone in the cottage. When his children had departed, he took up his guitar and played several mournful but sweet airs, more sweet and mournful than I had ever heard him play before. At first his countenance was illuminated with pleasure, but as he continued, thoughtfulness and sadness succeeded. At length, laying aside the instrument, he sat absorbed in reflection. My heart beat quick. This was the hour and moment of trial which would decide my hopes or realize my fears. I knocked. Who is there? 
said the old man. Come in. I entered. Pardon this intrusion, said I. I am a traveler in want of a little rest. You would greatly oblige me if you would allow me to remain a few minutes before the fire. I sat down, and a silence ensued. I knew that every minute was precious to me, yet I remained irresolute in what manner to commence the interview, when the old man addressed me. By your language, stranger, I suppose you are my countryman. Are you French? No, but I was educated by a French family, and understand that language only. I am now going to claim the protection of some friends whom I sincerely love, and of whose favor I have some hopes. These amiable people to whom I go have never seen me and know little of me. I am full of fears, for if I fail there, I am an outcast in the world forever. Do not despair. To be friendless is indeed to be unfortunate, but the hearts of men, when unprejudiced by any obvious self-interest, are full of brotherly love and charity. Rely, therefore, on your hopes, and if these friends are good and amiable, do not despair. They are kind. They are the most excellent creatures in the world. But unfortunately, they are prejudiced against me. I have good dispositions. My life has been hitherto harmless and in some degree beneficial. But a fatal prejudice clouds their eyes, and where they ought to see a feeling and kind friend, they behold only a detestable monster. That is indeed unfortunate. But if you are really blameless, cannot you undeceive them? I am about to undertake that task, and it is on that account that I feel so many overwhelming terrors. I tenderly love these friends. I have, unknown to them, been for many months in the habits of daily kindness towards them. But they believe that I wish to injure them, and it is that prejudice which I wish to overcome. Where do these friends reside? Near this spot. The old man paused and then continued. If you will unreservedly confide to me the particulars of your tale, I perhaps may be of use in undeceiving them. I am blind and cannot judge of your countenance, but there is something in your words which persuades me that you are sincere. I am poor and an exile, but it will afford me true pleasure to be in any way serviceable to a human creature. How can I thank you, my best and only benefactor? From your lips first have I heard the voice of kindness directed towards me. I shall be forever grateful, and your present humanity assures me of success with those friends whom I am on the point of meeting. May I know the names and residence of those friends? I paused. This, I thought, was the moment of decision, which was to rob me of or bestow happiness on me forever. I struggled vainly for firmness sufficient to answer him, but the effort destroyed all my remaining strength. I sank on the chair and sobbed aloud. At that moment I heard the steps of my younger protectors. I had not a moment to lose, but seizing the hand of the old man I cried, Now is the time. Save and protect me. You and your family are the friends whom I seek. Do not you desert me in the hour of trial. Great God! exclaimed the old man. Who are you? At that instant the cottage door was opened. Who can describe their horror and consternation on beholding me? Agatha fainted. Felix darted forward and with supernatural force tore me from his father to whose knees I clung. In a transport of fury, he dashed me to the ground and struck me violently with a stick. I could have torn him limb from limb as a lion rends the antelope. But my heart sunk within me as with bitter sickness, and I refrained. I saw him on the point of repeating his blow, when, overcome by pain and anguish, I quitted the cottage, and in the general tumult 
escaped unperceived to my hovel.